All right. So remember, this is where we finished. We'd finished talking about monosaccharides. Yeah. And we gave three good examples, glucose, galactose, and the last one? No. Fructose. There you go. Good, 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 good. All right. Now, what was kind of interesting about all these three sugars? They do. They've got the same molecular formula, C6H12O6. So they've all got the same number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, but they're arranged slightly differently in the molecule, and that gives them different chemical properties. And so I think we rounded out last time by looking at these different structures and how they differ. Yeah, is everybody okay with that? See how they can differ. All right. Now, because these have got six carbons, and as you'll see in a moment, they can actually form ring structures. We call them hexose sugars. Because the hexagon's got how many sides? Six. Six O's. Right, six. In fact, yeah. Good? Hexo sugars. So what do you think we'd call a sugar with five carbons in? A what? Pentose sugar. What about a, a sugar with just three carbons in? A trio sugar. Good. Now you get the hang of it. Good. So here are some pentose sugars. Okay. C5H10O5, they've still got that same 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. And these, ribose, is an important one. Deoxyribose and ribose sugar are important sugars in DNA and RNA. Okay? But again, we'll, when we talk about DNA and RNA, we'll represent them as ring structures. And then, of course, you can have some trios sugars which just have three carbons all right all right so this diagram just summarizes the different linear structures of these hexose pentose and trio sugars all right so I want to show you how we can get a ring structure from these linear structures so very often when these substances dissolve in water they form a ring structure and of course, in your body, they're primarily in an aqueous environment. So here's the linear structure. Now, I want you to pay attention to these carbons. They've got a number by them. And so very often in a molecule, so that we can get oriented, we number the carbons. So in this case, this carbon at the top with the double bonded oxygen is carbon number one. It's carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, five, and six. Is everyone okay with that? And we don't randomly reassign these numbers. They stick. This one with the double bond is always carbon one. So it can kind of go, you can then take this linear structure and you can see how we can kind of fold it, bend it around a little bit. Yeah, there's still our carbon number one with the double bonded oxygen, carbon two, three, four, five, and then six up there. Then what we're going to do is we're going to Take this hydrogen, connect it to this oxygen, so we're going to lose the double bond, and there's our OH group there, so that O turns into an OH group, because this hydrogen has sort of hopped off there and hopped onto there, okay? And then this oxygen can bond directly now to this carbon. Oxygen's bonded directly to the carbon. Is everyone okay with that? And then you've got carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, and carbon 6. All right, so this is our ring structure for glucose. Is everyone okay with that? See how that works? What's the purpose of it? It's, I wouldn't say there's a purpose. It's just what happens when we dissolve it. It can have these different yeah. structures. When we dissolve it in water, that's what happens. Yeah. Okay. So rather than draw everything in there, all of these like the carbons. Do you remember we talked about when, all, when there's a little apex there, when all these lines coalesce onto one point? There's a carbon there. Yeah, we just don't bother drawing it because we don't need to. We just know there's a carbon there. We know carbon forms four bonds, and sometimes we don't even bother drawing all the hydrogens. So this we call the abbreviated ring structure. And I'm going to show you this a whole bunch of times. But what molecule is it? Glucose. It's glucose in particular. All right? Good, and I'm going to talk 
about one, two, three, four, five, and six, I'm going to talk about these carbon numbers when we talk about some of the chemical bonds. Okay? All right. But is everybody comfortable with that? Let's take the linear one, make it into a ring. All right, good. Okay. So now we're going to talk about disaccharides. Disaccharides, of course, is when you've got two monosaccharides chemically bonded together with a covalent bond. The generic reaction where we bond those two monosaccharides together is called a dehydration reaction, and it liberates water. And the specific bond name, the bond type, is a covalent bond. The reaction which joins them together is a dehydration reaction. But the specific name of that bond that links together two monosaccharides is called a glycosidic linkage. Sometimes we'll call it a glycosidic bond. So if I link together one glucose molecule to another glucose molecule, what's the name of the bond that joins the two? A glycosidic linkage or a glycosidic bond. Oh. Yeah? <coughs> Sorry? It does. We'll jump on, we'll get on to maltose. Good. All right, so if I link together another glucose molecule to another glucose molecule, what's the name of that bond? Glycosidic linkage. All right? What's the reaction type which joins the two together? Dehydration synthesis or a dehydration reaction. Now, what's the bond type? What type of bond is a glycosidic linkage? Good. All right. You okay? I know it's a lot thrown at you, but as long as you get that straight. All right, bond type, covalent bond. The reaction is a dehydration reaction. The specific name of that bond is a glycosidic linkage or a glycosidic bond. Good? Okay. All right, so let's have a look at some examples of some disaccharides. Oh, my goodness. Your lives are changed by disaccharides. Have you ever thought about that? Your entire life can be completely changed by the disaccharides around you and the disaccharides that you consume. So we're going to look at some examples then. Here's an example of disaccharide. It's sucrose, which is table sugar. Now, table sugar or sucrose is a natural substance. It's naturally found in the roots of many plants. And it's naturally found in the fruits of many plants. And it's naturally found in the nectar found in flowers. And the sucrose content in fruit increases as the fruit ripens. So unripe fruit doesn't taste as sweet, does it, as ripened fruit. But you know what's funny? is when you go to the supermarket and you choose a pineapple, for example, the sweetest pineapples are the ones that honestly look the worst. They have no green colour on them. They look like they're starting to turn. It's the sort of thing where you say, oh, I'm going to throw that away. By far the sweetest. The greenest ones, the ones that are much less spongy, not sweet at all. Sorry? Absolutely. Same with bananas, same with most fruits, actually. Pears are another really good example. As they get on the really ripe side, you start to see black appearing on the outside. They are the super juicy ones. So why would a fruit increase its sugar content as it ripens? Why does it want to get more tasty as it ripens? It's going to eat me, I'm dying. It's not quite eat me because I'm dying, <laughs> but it has to do with that. Why is it? Yeah is to make it very attractive to frugivores, something that eats fruit. That's the whole point of a fruit, right? I'm going to make myself super sweet and juicy, so something's going to eat me, and when it eats me, it's going to consume the seeds, it's going to trot off somewhere else, defecate, drop those seeds out in a nice little pile of fertilizer, dispersed away from the parent plant. Before those seeds are ready to germinate, before this fruit is ripe, the fruit doesn't want to be tasty because the seeds aren't ready to germinate. That's why it keeps its sugar content low and sometimes makes itself really sour and nasty to discourage something eating it. Okay? All right. Now, fruit's good to eat. Why is fruit good to eat? Well, it tastes good, obviously, but why is fruit's good for you? Why is it good for you? 
Sorry? Energy from the sugars, absolutely. Yeah, that's one role, energy from the sugars. What else? Because it is a natural sugar that your body knows. Like it is a natural sugar that your body knows. You have a long evolutionary past with sucrose. You've been eating fruit and your ancestors have before you were a homo sapien for probably millions of years. All right? Long evolutionary past. Your body can deal with sucrose very nicely, very easily. Okay? Um, but so... Hang on, what was my question? Why, do we eat fruit? Why is fruit good for us? Why is fruit good for you? <laughs> Why is fruit good for you? There's a whole bunch of other stuff in the fruit which is very good for you and you need it, but only at tiny low quantities. Okay? Such low quantities sometimes you can't taste it, but you can taste the sugar. So you so the so fruit's good for you and you you're able to taste the sugar, all right? So you taste the sugar, you munch that down, that has benefits to you, but it's all the other things that are present at very low levels that are extremely good for you, which is why you've got, um, I guess, this evolutionary history with sugar, this evolutionary love affair with sugar. The sugar itself gives you energy, but it's all the other things you get from eating the fruit, which is why fruit tastes good to you, all right? In fact, when you eat that sugar, you even get a little slug of dopamine released in your brain, which is like, part of your reward circuitry. So you are evolutionally driven to eat sugar, but it's because of all the good stuff in fruit. Is that kind of like when, I don't know, like, so your body, kind of like with oh, pregnant women who have cravings and their body's like trying to find certain nutrients? It might be. Honestly, I don't know enough about that to comment, but you I've got... Have you pregnant before? I never have, <laughs> oddly enough. All right? I don't know enough to comment, but I've got to think there's got to be a reason for it. It might just be one of those human oddities, but I think there's probably a reason for it. Okay. All right, now, of course, what we've done is we've said, oh, let's forget about all the junk in the fruit that's really good for you. Let's just refine the heck out of it and make sugar, because that's what tastes good. All right, so we're giving you the sugar without all the good parts of it. All right. So this is what a sucrose molecule looks like. It's a disaccharide. It's made from a fructose monosaccharide covalently linked via a glycosidic linkage to a glucose monosaccharide. All right, so sucrose is fructose and glucose, two molecules linked together. Now, in natural normal sucrose, fructose and glucose are found in equal ratios, one to one. Okay? All right. So there, the fruit. Mmm, tastes so good if you get the ripened stuff. It's got lots and lots of good things in it for you. But, of course, what we've done is said, well, let's just not worry about what's good for you. Let's worry about the taste, right? And let's just compact sugar into stuff like this, which is not good for you. But what makes things worse is most sodas don't even have natural sugar, don't have cane sugar. Some of them do, but it says so on it. Most of them have high fructose corn syrup, which is essentially a chemically manufactured sugar from cornstarch. And it doesn't contain a one-to-one -one ratio of fructose to glucose. There's a little bit more fructose than glucose, some byproducts, and your body can't deal with that in the same way. All right, everybody okay with sucrose? Good old table sugar. Okay, here's another one, maltose. Millions upon millions upon millions of dollars revolve around maltose. Anyone know why? Probably in the billions of dollars. Sorry? So, yes. Maltose, sometimes called malt sugar, is found in germinating seeds. So think about a seed, a grain in particular. As the grains start to germinate, they have to break down their starch supplies and mobilize it into something that's soluble, they can move around as something that's more readily usable. And they break it down to maltose. Now, maltose happens to be a very good sugar for beer making, all right? So it's very important in beer making, the sugar maltose. It's why we use grains to make beer, one reason. And so maltose then is a disaccharide made of two glucose molecules joined together with a glycosidic linkage. And that makes sense because starch itself is a polysaccharide made of many glucose molecules linked together. And we'll talk about starch in a moment. All right, so there's our grains. 
when they start to germinate, we start to get very high maltose levels in the seeds, and that's what maltose is. So what do you think tastes sweeter? An unripe wheat seed or one where it's just about starting to germinate? Starting to germinate. Yeah, I don't honestly know if you can taste the difference when you munch on it a little bit. Um, you might, but it should. Okay, so that's maltose. Now onto our last disaccharide, and that's lactose, and we call that milk sugar. Milk sugar because we find it in milk. Found in milk. About 8 to 10% of milk by, I guess it must be by weight, is lactose. Quite a lot. Although la milk doesn't necessarily taste sweet, does it? It kind of does, but not really. But there's a bunch of lactose in it. So here's the structure of lactose, and lactose is made from a molecule of glucose covalently linked by a glycosidic linkage to a molecule of galactose. All right, that's the disaccharide. Now, milk is, of course, a substance that mammals produce, right? Mammals produce milk. I want you to think about this. What kind of milk do we drink? Cow's milk. Well... Yeah, Pasteurized? we do drink cow's milk, sometimes goat milk and so on. But as infants, as babies, we oh. drink human milk. Yeah. Imagine that, human milk, right? And so we need the lactose in the human milk as a source of energy, a rapidly available source of energy, more rapidly available than the fat that's in the milk. All right, so what do little puppy dogs drink? Your puppy's milk? Your dog's milk? Dog's milk, yeah. I don't know, what do little baby lambs drink? What do little baby humans drink? What do we drink? Our right. What do adult humans drink? <laughs> cow's milk. Does that seem funny? Dogs drink dog's milk, but humans drink cow's milk. Seems kind of weird, doesn't it? No? Milk is really baby cow growth food. Yeah? You wouldn't drink dog's milk, would you? <laughs> Cat's milk? No? Seems kind of gross. Yeah? All right. So we drink cow's milk, and many folks are lactose intolerant. They can't deal with the lactose in the milk that you drink and other dairy products. Now, it's kind of interesting. We do have an evolutionary past as adults drinking milk. As infants, we're able to produce the enzymes that can break down lactose. All right? It's, sometimes you get infants that can't tolerate lactose, but most can and as adults, you kind of lose that ability and you become lactose intolerant. You can't process lactose properly. But because of our evolutionary past with milk, and it varies depending on what human group you look at on the earth, then many humans as adults can process lactose because you produce the enzymes that are able to break it down. If you're lactose intolerant, you don't break down that sugar. And as soon as that sugar gets to your large intestine where there are tons of bacteria, the bacteria have a field day. Like, oh, sugar, love it. And they're breaking down the sugar and they're producing gases. And it's, oh, not so good for you. All right? Are so. We, are we really supposed to only drink milk like as infants? So if you look at our evolutionary past, most <coughs> mammals, yes, only drink milk as infants. I don't think there are any other mammals that drink milk as adults routinely. <coughs> all right? So. But because we've got an evolutionary past drinking milk, then we're able to produce lactose into adulthood and we're able to process the milk into adulthood. But a lot of people aren't. They're the ones that are lactose intolerant. And again, the lactose, the reason, it makes it through your small intestine relatively undigested, it gets to your large intestine, the bacteria do all sorts of things with it. And so you can have diarrhea and bloating from the gas and it's just generally not good if you're lactose intolerant because your body hasn't broken it down. It's the bacteria having a big slug of sugar. Yep. So if, like when we're babies, we can drink milk and everything like that, we have the enzymes. So when you're adult, when you become lactose intolerant, how do you lose those enzymes? So I'm not quite sure of the process. I think it's an age-related thing, but you just essentially switch off the mechanisms that produces these enzymes with age. If you look at your evolutionary past, you know, you, you go on to solid foods. You don't drink milk. You're separated from your mother. You can't have a, re a reliance into adulthood on your mother to drink milk. Huh. Um, now I believe, now these st stats might be a little bit sketchy, but I think if you're of European descent or sort of the European groups, about 70% of people can process lactose. 
if you go to other ethnic groups like Africa. Now, I know you've got certain groups in Africa that live on blood and milk, but most don't. All right? uh, it's only about 30% of them can tolerate lactose well. The rest of the folks are lactose intolerant because okay? they can't process the lactose. They don't make the enzymes to do it to adulthood. Okay. All right. So let's just summarize a glucose molecule <coughs> linking to another glucose molecule, just a normal dehydration reaction. One loses a hydroxyl group, one loses a hydrogen to produce water, and then we have our, our disaccharide. In this case, we've linked two glucose molecules together and we get maltose. Now, I'm going to have you look at these carbons. Here's carbon one in this glucose molecule. And here's carbon-4 in this glucose molecule, okay? It's the linkage, the glycosidic linkage, is between carbon-1 and carbon-4 via this oxygen. So we call it a 1-4 glycosidic linkage. So that 1 and the 4 refers to the carbons. Is everyone okay with that? Similarly, we can take a glucose and link it to a fructose, all right? Dehydration synthesis, water's released. There's our sucrose molecule. In this case, it's a 1-2 glycosidic linkage because it's between carbon-1 and carbon-2. Good? All right. Now, in a moment, I'm going to add an alpha and a beta to this 1-2, 1-4 glycosidic linkage, but I'll explain that. But you're all comfortable with the 1-4 and the 1-2, where that comes from. Good. All right. And as usual, it's always, always better to watch the movie. Plants make sucrose by joining glucose. Sometimes organisms link sugar molecules in pairs to form disaccharide. Here are several examples. Plants make sucrose by joining glucose and fructose. Sucrose circulates in plant sap, and we obtain it from sugar cane and sugar beets and use it as table sugar. Lactose is formed by joining galactose and glucose. Lactose is the disaccharide that gives milk its sweet taste. Maltose consists of two linked glucose molecules. Digestion of starch in a sprouting seed or in the intestine of an animal produces this disaccharide. Good. All right. So now we can look at polysaccharides. Poly means many. Saccharide refers to sugar. So you're going to look at polysaccharides. So polysaccharides then are the polymers of sugars. And there are usually many, many, many sugars linked together. In the hundreds or hundreds of thousands of them linked together. Now these are four of the polysaccharides that I'm going to talk about in any depth. We're going to talk about starch, glycogen, cellulose, and how'd you say that last one? Chitin. Chitin. Yep. Okay. All right. You okay with what a polysaccharide is? Yeah. Okay. All right. So starch then. Starch is an energy storage polysaccharide produced by plants. So if I was to ask you what's the function of starch, what would you say? It's an energy storage molecule, yep. Yeah. And it's, sorry? You can think about it, yeah. So energy storage molecule. All right. Produced by what? Plants. Plants or <coughs> plants, very good. All right. And what's, what's the, all right, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> so starch then is a polymer of glucose monomers. It's made of glucose. Thousands of glucose molecules linked together by what kind of bond? Glycosidic bonds, yep. So think about this. Plants produce glucose by photosynthesis. And then they link those glucose molecules together to form tiny little starch granules within chloroplasts 
or within other parts of the cell. Now, what are some of the physical properties of glucose? Think about glucose and water. What happens when you get glucose to water? It dissolves, it does. Now that has all sorts of issues, and we'll talk about these in a later week. Um, you can alter the solute concentration and the osmotic pressure and the movement of water and all sorts of other things when you add glucose to water. If you add enough glucose to water, it actually makes a thick syrupy mess, doesn't it? Yeah. All right. So plants, think about it. If they were to photosynthesize and keep producing glucose, 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 and the glucose levels really build up, leaves would taste syrupy sweet, right? They would be a big sticky mess inside. So plants can't store a lot of glucose, all right? Primarily because it's soluble. There are other reasons why, but that's one. So what they do is they store it as starch. Now starch is insoluble. It does not dissolve in water, okay? So they link together the glucose molecules, thousands of them together, and it forms little granules which are insoluble, okay? And that's great for storage because when it rains, they don't go anywhere, right? Okay. All right, so think about cornstarch. Yep, you know what cornstarch is, very fine powder. Yep, so that's pure starch, really. It's a pretty good form of pure starch. When you add that to water, what happens to it? Just cold water. When you add it to cold water, what happens to it? It forms a suspension. Tiny little particles just float around. If you leave it for long enough, it all settles to the bottom. Right? It doesn't dissolve. To get it to dissolve, and it doesn't truly dissolve, you've got to heat the water up. Right? And then it sort of seems to disappear, but it forms something called a colloid, all right? which is kind of complicated. But anyway, starch doesn't dissolve. It's a great way to store glucose, a very compact way to store glucose. All right. So the glucose monomers then are linked together by an alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage. All right, so let's explain the alpha part, because I think you're good with the 1,4 and the glycosidic parts, yeah? Is that a yes? Okay. No? One more time. You're good with the 1,4 glycosidic parts. Yeah, you know what that means, don't you? We just explained it. Yeah? But the alpha part, I've not talked about yet. That's what I want to explain next. All right. So think about this. As animals, you eat starch to access the energy stored in the starch. And maybe you need some carbon so you can eat the starch to access the carbon. Now, if you take any kind of starchy vegetable and fry it, it tastes good. That's another reason why we eat it, right? It tastes good. Okay, so there's our grains. Grains contain an awful lot of starch. It's the white stuff in the grains, all right? And when we take the grains and we mill it, then we make flour. Flour is primarily starch. And then take a vegetable like a potato. Potatoes, again, are, have an awful high starch content. And the potato, for the, from the plant perspective, is a storage organ, all right? They make the glucose with photosynthesis, then they shunt it down, the, the glucose, the potato, where it gets polymerized into starch, and then the potato grows more starch, more starch, and it stores all of that starch, lots and lots of energy stored in it. The wheat seed, smaller than a potato, but it's where the plant stores an awful lot of starch. Both the potato and the wheat seed have got to survive some sort of period without the plant photosynthesizing. Once the wheat plant dies, all that's left is the wheat seed. Once the potato plant dies, the only thing that's left is the potato underground. They need to have an energy store to germinate and grow a new plant. And they get that energy store by breaking down the starch that was stored. Everyone okay with that? Everybody see that? So they're storage structures. So this is a scanning electron micrograph looking inside a plant cell. And these little granules are starch granules stored in the plant cell. 
And if we were to sort of unravel the starch in those starch granules, we would see all of these glucose molecules joined together. And they're joined together by these alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. Yeah, one after the other joined together. Now, in starch, these big, long chains of glucose <coughs> tend to form a helix or a spiral. Okay? And that's how they're stored. Every one of those gluc glucose molecules is joined together by an alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkage. Yep. All right. Okay, so let's explain the alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkage, or the alpha part then. So here we've got one, two, three, four glucose molecules linked together, right, from starch. Now I want you to look at the orientation of these glucose molecules. All right, here's our carbon-1. Carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6. Okay? This, this is how you can recognize it. This glucose molecule is exactly the same orientation as this glucose molecule, isn't it? It's almost like I've taken this one, cut, copied and pasted it there, copied and pasted it there, copied and pasted it there. They're just carbon copies, the way they're all lined up. Okay? So I want you to look at this oxygen and this OH group. The oxygen is always in the same place, just there, just there, there, and there. And the OH group is always in this diagram pointing down, there, 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 and there. So the glucose molecules are in the same orientation to each other, every one of them, okay? And they're just linked. That's what makes it an alpha linkage. So it's alpha because the glucose molecules are in the same orientation, And it's a 1,4 because it's between carbon 1 and carbon 4. And that's how the glucose molecules are joined in a starch molecule. Okay? So I want you to obviously know that there are alpha-1,4 linkages <coughs> joined together the glucose molecule and starch, but I also want you to be able to recognize it, that it is an alpha, and you can see how you can recognize it's an alpha linkage, yeah? Okay. All right, so let's have a look at the movie. Polysaccharides are polymers long chains consisting of hundreds to thousands of linked monosaccharides. Quick moving. <laughs> so you've got starch at the top. Yep. Now we're going to talk about glycogen and cellulose and then another polysaccharide called chitin. But it's all basically, they're all very similar in the fact that they are polymers of glucose joined together. Now, have a look at glycogen in that diagram. What would you say? Alpha bonds between them? Yes. Same orientation? Mm -hmm. Now look at cellulose. Yeah. Can't you see? This glucose is a different orientation to this glucose, isn't it? It's almost like the second glucose has been flipped. Can everybody see that? Oxygen there, up, oxygen's down there. <coughs> oxygen up, oxygen down. Okay? So these bonds are not alpha bonds, are they? They are beta bonds. Now, you don't need to write that down now. We'll, I'll go into cellulose in depth in a moment. But I, this diagram shows alpha bonds, alpha bonds, beta bonds. Good? It's still a 1,4 bond because it's between carbon 1 and carbon 4. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move on to our next carbohydrate, our next polysaccharide, sorry, glycogen. So glycogen is also an energy storage molecule. It's an energy storage polysaccharide, but in animals. Now, glycogen, unlike starch, is a highly branched molecule. 
Starch is mostly linear with a few branches. Glycogen, on the other hand, is very highly branched. It's also made from glucose monomers, and it has primarily alpha-1,4 linkages, but at every branch point, there's an alpha-1,6 glycosidic linkage. So at a branch point, if we've got a glucose molecule, there's our oxygen, carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6. Okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and carbon 6. I'm not going to draw anything else. All right? At a branch point, this carbon is going to be linked to carbon 1 of another glucose molecule. Okay? And on the linear part, this molecule will be linked number one to number four. So glucose molecule, glucose molecule, glucose molecule, and at a branch point, we can branch it up here. Everyone okay with that? Okay. So glycogen then, an energy storage polysaccharide. It's very important in you. You rely on your glycogen stores and it's stored mostly in the liver and muscle cells. Now you've got about a one day storage of glycogen in your body. Yep, depending on what you've eaten, but your body keeps about a one day reserve of glycogen in your body. And of course, anytime you need glucose, all you've got to do break down the glycogen molecule and that releases glucose molecules into your blood and you use those during, for cellular respiration. Okay? All right. So why store glucose as glycogen? Why not just store it as glucose? Right, glucose water soluble. Oh, you regulate your glucose levels very carefully in your blood. Right? Your body does a really good job at regulating glucose levels, regardless of the diet that you have, almost, unless you're a diabetic. So would you imagine that glycogen is soluble or insoluble? Insoluble. It forms little granules. It does. All right. <clears throat> so to release the glucose molecules, just like releasing the glucose molecules in starch, we undergo a hydrolysis reaction, and that cleaves... glucose molecules off one at a time. So when you need glucose, you hydrolyze your glycogen molecules, releasing glucose molecules. <clears throat> now muscles would be a good place to store glycogen, wouldn't they? Because you use a lot of glucose in your muscles. They're a very active organ of your body. Your liver, on the other hand, not so active, really, is it? In fact, your liver is a very metabolically active organ, all right? In fact, so metabolically active that it increases the temperature of your blood a little bit from all the metabolism that goes on. But it doesn't really match the muscles when you're actively exercising, right? But your liver has a phenomenally good blood supply, so it's a very rapid way to get glucose into your body from those glycogen reserves by storing it in the liver. Your liver is also a big organ and can store it in that way. Okay, so glycogen, there's a transmission electron micrograph of some muscle cells and there are some little glycogen granules in the muscle tissue, shown as little granules. And if we were to unravel those granules, you would see glucose molecules linked together, the linear part, one, four bonds, and where there's a branch, like here, branching off, you've got a one, six bond. Good? All right. So glycogen, again, is quite a big branched molecule. And this diagram here, if you can... If you got close enough to it, every single one of these is a glucose molecule joint. Can you see them? All the little parts in those long chains. Now, there's actually a protein in the center. All right? The polymerized glucose in a glycogen molecule are actually linked to a protein in the very center. 
But if you were to have a look at these chains, they look like this, and there's our glucose molecules, there's our 1,6 bond, there's our 1,4 bonds. Okay? All right. So, what I want you to do is think about the similarities and the differences between starch and glycogen. All right. So, a very useful study technique is for you to do these compare and contrast exercises yourself. So a compare and contrast is simply this. You can make a table and you can say, similarities and differences. You know what, I'm going to... I'm going to change that a little bit. I'm going to say, let's make starch. And glycogen into the columns. Now let's think about how they're similar and how they're different. What's one way that they're similar? Both energy storage polysaccharides. Good. Both energy storage polysaccharides. And I might want to write that down. Energy storage poly. Poly. Good. So that would be a similarity. Yep. All right. Tell me a difference between the two of them. Hold that thought. Animals and plants, right? Starch is produced by plants. Glycogen is produced by animals. All right, what was the difference you had at the back? Well, that was actually the last one. But you said a different one, didn't you? No. Did you say branched versus unbranched? All right, good. I must have read your mind. <laughs> Didn't somebody say branched versus unbranched? Okay. So, one of them is highly branched. One of them is much less branched. So, which one is the highly branched? Highly branched. I'm going to say linear. All right? And maybe put slight branching. All right, and we can carry on, can't we, going over the similarities and the differences. So I can construct these tables for you, but they're not m of much use to you when I construct them. The, the l at least half the learning that goes into this is you constructing it yourself, all right? For you to sort of look back and review and reflect upon the work and the learning and then to summarize and synthesize it in a different way that it was presented to you. Does that make sense? So I encourage you to construct these tables. Compare and contrast are a, are a good way to learn this stuff. And you can add some other columns because we're going to talk about some other polysaccharides. All right? Okay. Do more than just these three differences and similarities that we've gone over. There's lots more. But there's one that I want to focus on a little bit. And it has to do with the structural difference. Linear versus branched. Structure relates to function. There has to be a functional reason for that structural difference. What could that be? Maybe because it's highly branched animals accept it more and plants aren't going to have that linear I'm speculating a little bit when I give you this reason, but... Is one alpha and one beta? Or Both alpha. All right, so I'll tell you this. When you break down these molecules, the enzymes typically break them down at the ends, at the very end. So if there's a glucose molecule at the end, it breaks them off one at a time from the ends. I'm sure there's some breaking down in the middle, but it's primarily at the ends. There's a little clue for you.
on the right tracks. I'm not quite sure it's anything about them growing up, but think about if they're both energy storage and you need to access the energy in them. It's the difference between an animal and a plant. Animal needs it quicker. Animal needs it quicker. I'm speculating a little bit here, all right? I'm coming up with, I guess, a, an idea, a hypothesis for the structural difference. Animals need to mobilize glucose very, very quickly. So I want you to think about this. You're walking down a dark alley, right? And somebody jumps out of you. And you get that instant, <gasps> right? You get that fight or flight mechanism kicks in. And immediately your heart rate goes quickly, you get some tunnel vision, and your body goes into a really sort of crazy mode where it shunts blood to your vital organs. Your digestive system, whoop, doesn't get so much blood. That's why you get that butterfly feeling in your tummy. You just cut off the blood supply from your digestive system. It roots it to things like muscles and brain, vital organs. All right? Breathing rate goes up heart rate goes up, they're the things that you can perceive, and you immediately start to mobilize glucose from glycogen stores quickly to give you the energy to either run away and escape the, the whatever it is that's frightening you, or to stay and fight and hopefully survive. All right, so nature equips you with that fight or flight defense response, which works very, very well. Now, so if you've got all of these branched, branch, sorry, branch points, and, all, and many, many ends to the molecule, you can mobilize glucose very quickly from that, can't you? And so that glucose gets dumped into the bloodstream very fast. Now what you think about a plant. Here's the plant, right? And a bunny rabbit sneaking up to the plant and it's about to pounce. The plant doesn't launch into this fight or flight response, does it? The plant doesn't, oh, I'm gonna eat. Now, now, plants aren't defenseless completely, but their defenses are very, very different. There's no fight or flight defense response. So a plant doesn't necessarily need to mobilize its energy reserves very, very quickly. So it can get by with a molecule which has very few ends, and so glucose is only mobilized slowly. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Now we're going to move on to cellulose. And again, I would encourage you to construct this table. And you can add cellulose as a column. And you can continue to do your compare and contrast. So cellulose, then, it's a structural polysaccharide and a major component of plant cell walls. All right. So it's not for energy, but it's for what? Structure. Structural. So what could I give this line a title? Purpose. Function, purpose, role. Yep, the role. All right. And cellulose is also a polymer of glucose. Oh my goodness, glucose is all over the place, isn't it? You never really thought about it that much. Every time you see a plant, it's one big polymer of glucose, really. Not completely, but... So it's a polymer of glucose. And the glucose molecules are linked together by beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages. Now, I'll explain this glucose part in a bit more depth. So glucose can have an alpha or a beta structure when it forms its ring structure, okay? And in cellulose, we've got an alpha glucose bonded to a beta glucose, which is then bonded to an alpha glucose, which is then bonded to a beta glucose. So the alpha and the, and the beta glucoses alternate in the linear polymer. So let's have a look at this then. Here we've got our alpha orientation of glucose. So here's our linear glucose. Let's put it in solution. Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now look at these OH groups. Now 
This can also form a ring in the beta conformation. Now, here you've got the OH attached to carbon 1 is up there close to the oxygen in the beta version. In the alpha version, it's down here by the other OH group. Sorry? Going off the chart in the middle, carbon 2 would be a beta linkage then, beta 1, 4? So in this one, there are no glycosidic linkages because glycosidic linkages join glucose molecules together. What we're showing here is here's the linear conformation of glucose. It can form a ring structure this way, which is the alpha conformation, and you've got your OH group, OH on carbon 1 and the OH on carbon 2, Think about them as being next to each other. The beta conformation, there's carbon 1, there's carbon 2. Well, the OH is not. These are flipped. Okay? Is everyone okay with that? So it's alpha and beta? You've got an alpha ring structure and a beta ring structure. Okay? Yeah? Yeah. So... I'm probably not going to ask you, like on site, to recognize, is this an alpha and this is a beta, to, to present the two and say, tell me the difference. But I would expect you to recognize that there is a difference if I gave the two of them together. Okay? And that difference is important. Subtle, isn't it? But important. All right. So now, when we join this glucose to this glucose, okay, we've still got carbon 1 joined to carbon 4. All right, but we call this a beta 1,4 glycosidic linkage. All right, in the beta conformation, that glucose molecule flips around. Okay, good. And you can contrast that to the alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage up there. Now you know what you're looking for. That's a really striking difference, isn't it? But oh my goodness, that one difference means that cellulose has massively different properties to starch. Even though they're both almost linear polymers of glucose. So if we were to sort of break down a cellulose molecule, here's these microfibrils in a plant cell wall. All right? And these little microfibrils then, if we were to sort of look into them, are made of all of these linear chains of glucose molecules. Glucose molecule joined to a glucose molecule with a beta 1,4 bond. Now, that allows these long linear chains of glucose to be connected to each other with hydrogen bonding. Because of the beta 1,4 connection. So... The hydrogen bonding, hmm, it must be between this oxygen maybe and a hydrogen and this oxygen and a hydrogen. And it must be because of the beta bonds, yes, or to the, the flipped orientation. There must be more going on than just that, all right? And this is quite a simplistic picture of what cellulose is really like because there's many other things in the cell wall. But that must be the reason for the hydrogen bonding. So it's just not branched? Not branched, linear. So you've got covalent bonds between the glucose monomers. Covalent bonds are very strong. Now you've got hydrogen bonds between the chains. That explains why cellulose itself is a very, very strong structural polymer. And if you think about it, I mean, trees are made more than of just cellulose. But the structure of a tree is mostly plant cell walls. It explains why... Wood and plants are so strong. Think about rope that we can make out of natural fibers. It's incredibly strong. And it's a result of all these covalent bonds and hydrogen bonding. So sometimes it's hard to picture what the cell wall is or where it, where it is or what it's like. This is a scanning electron micrograph of those microfibrils and plant cell wall. But here is a plant cell and it's this thick structure that surrounds the cell. Just inside the cell wall is a cell membrane. Okay, and you've seen plant cells under the microscope, haven't you? Okay. Alright, is everybody okay with cellulose then? Structurally. 
Now you have enzymes that can break, oh, that should be alpha, that can break alpha 1,4 linkages. So anytime there are alpha 1,4 linkages around, enzymes in your digestive system can break those bonds. That explains why a potato is essentially a big pile of sugar, right? You break it down into sugar. It's why flour is a big pile of sugar. You break it down into sugar because you can break those alpha-1,4 bonds. So anything that has an alpha-1,4 linkage, you can break that bond and you can access the glucose. Starch is one, glycogen is another. But you can't break these beta linkages. You don't produce enzymes that break the beta-1,4 linkages in cellulose. So when you eat plants, while well, you can break down the starch, you can't break down the cellulose in the cell walls. It essentially passes through your digestive system as insoluble fibre. Now, just because you can't digest it doesn't it say it's not important, because it's really important. <coughs> can anybody think of an important role of insoluble fibre, why it's important to have it in your diet? Did you say poop? Yeah. No. Well, I mean, what do they say in English? That's right. We would never use that word. <laughs> you guys are refined. Defecation, maybe. <laughs> All right. So, insoluble fiber is a really important part of your diet because it does, it provides some bulk. You've got peristaltic contractions of your digestive system, these rhythmic muscle contractions that push the food down. All right. And it's got to move down. Now, there's a couple of ways that that happens. Firstly, it has an easier time doing this to more solid materials, that peristaltic right, motion. So you've got some bulk there. It's just not getting broken down, so it's something to physically push along. But some of these insoluble fibers are kind of rough on the lining of your digestive system. And as they move down, they kind of abrade it. And that causes your, your gut lining to produce mucus. And that mucus smooths and slides and speeds up the passage of food through your digestive system. So whole grain bread, where you take the whole grain and you grind it up and you don't extract very much from it, that's got a lot of insoluble fiber. Right? That's good, it moves things down quickly. But let's take white bread. What we've done with white bread is taken the grain, said, oh, let's forget about all the good stuff. Let's just keep the starch, right? And now you've just got starch, it's basically sugar, and there's nothing to help push it down. Interesting difference. How many of you eat a lot of white bread? No. Go on. Fess up. Well, actually, yeah, no, I do like All right. <laughs> I still like bread. Make the switch. Your, digestive, like your digestive system will thank you. All right. So. Do you consider pasta too? Sorry? Like different pastas and stuff? Do you mean pasta? <laughs> okay. If, you, if you're talking about pasta, pasta. Well, now we're doing the, the hard A pasta. It's. Pasta. It's pasta. <laughs> All right. Okay. You good with that? Right. Pasta. Pasta is mostly made from flour and eggs. All right. That's it. Now you can get whole grain pasta, which presumably uses flour from the whole grain, or you've just got regular old non-whole grain pasta, which is just the white flour. Yep. Starch. That's what you're getting from it. Sugar, I want you to look at all of these sources of starch as just a bowl of sugar, okay? Because that's what your body converts it into, by and large. So even though you don't have the enzymes to break down the beta-1,4 linkages, many bacteria and fungi have enzymes that can digest cellulose. They can break down those linkages. Well, that's fortunate, isn't it? Yeah. Why is that fortunate? We do. Think about if you're a fungus and you feed on a plant. It would be really nice if you could break down the thing that you're feeding on. Yeah, And they're able to break down and attack plants and be successful of it. One reason is because they've got the enzymes to break down the tough cell walls. Similar way for bacteria. But think about this. You've got 
bacteria in your colons, your large intestine. And those bacteria are able to break down some of the cellulose that you eat. Not a lot. Most of the cellulose passes through your gut. It comes out the other end, processed a little bit, but relatively undigested. But the bacteria are able to break down some of that cellulose. It's one reason why if you have a very high fiber diet, you produce a lot of gas, because those bacteria, when they break down the cellulose, also produce gas. All right. So if you're a herbivore, that's an animal that eats primarily plants, you've got to be able to access the calories and the nutrients in the leaves, which is largely cellulose. So if you're a herbivore like a cow or a bunny rabbit or a termite or a grasshopper, I'm going to focus on cows and termites, you've got to be able to digest that cellulose, but you don't necessarily make the enzymes to do it yourself. So in your gut, you have symbiotic microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, and protists, all living symbiotically in the gut, and they are able to break down the cellulose, release it, so that the animal can have access to the, set, to the glucose in the cellulose. Isn't it just as well that we can't really break down cellulose? Otherwise, that salad that you eat has just as many calories as a big old bowl of french fries, right? Imagine if you could access all the glucose in the cellulose that you ate. All of those low calorie foods would suddenly have a massive number of calories. So if we take a termite, and we can do this, there are lots of termites in Arizona, we can go out and we can squeeze them. Sometimes you've got to pop them, but sometimes you just squeeze them. All right? And out their, out their anus, which is at the end of their abdomen, you can squeeze out gut content. Put it on a microscope slide, and it doesn't look too dissimilar to this. These are all the gut microbes that termites have. And those gut microbes are the ones producing the enzymes to break down the wood that the termites feed on. Now, cows also, what's going on here? It's, um, is that like a tree? it's a port. All right. Why are you looking like this? Are you all beef eaters? Anybody not a beef eater? All right, you're not a beef eater. Most of you eat beef. So the agricultural production of beef, oh my goodness. If you watch some movies and get a real insight as to what goes on, right? But this is a port, right? And it's... In, to enable you to stick your hand in and take samples of inside the gut of the cow. So we need to regularly monitor what the diets, what effect they're having on the cows, right? So what this woman's doing, there's the port, it's open to the outside. Yep, she can put her hand in and get access to the stomach. It's an easy way to do it. Grab some of the stomach content or of the different parts of their digestive system pull it out, and then you can look at that on a microscope slide, and you can see all the symbiotic microorganisms that are breaking down the cellulose. They also do it because, of course, you've got to assess, you know, the diet that cows are fed when they're not out eating grass is a very sort of carefully controlled, formulated, manufactured diet. Lots of grains, right? Cows didn't evolve to eat grains. They evolved to eat grass, but we give them lots of grains because it makes them grow super quickly because there's a lot of starch there, a lot of cellulose they can break down. But it changes what goes on inside their gut. The food you eat changes what goes on inside your gut. The food the cows eat changes what goes on inside their gut. And we need to monitor it. And so a quick monitoring system is this. Now see on the cow's back, there's the plug for it. Once you get your hand out, you sort of plug it back up. Seems gnarly, doesn't it? If you don't like it, stop eating meat. Right. Have you ever done that? Sorry? Have I ever put my hand in? No. I would love to. I really would. Even though I feel, te I feel terrible for the cow. It's not right, is yeah, it, really? No, we went on a field trip and we all had to do that. You did that? Yeah. Awesome. Where was your field trip? Yeah. In New Mexico, I don't know. Where. What was your school? Um, it was like a little school in a small town. Was it like high school? No, I was in like, College? El like elementary school. No <laughs> kidding. That is awesome. Those field trips are so memorable, aren't they? <laughs> they are. Good. Now, did you, so what did you remember about putting your hand in? Warm. The, you could like feel the fibers. Yep. Of the grass. Warm and hot, and you can feel the grass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or do they just like drill a hole in the side and just? I wouldn't say drill it, but <laughs> it's. But I'm sure it's. 
I'm sure it's done by a vet. I'm sure it's surgically done. But it's a routine, common thing done to cows. Yeah. 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 And I can't even imagine, you know, I mean, this is just an infection waiting to happen. Yeah. So, oh, look at that. Look at all the stuff I can get in the cow yeah. there. Yeah. Hang on. Do, are you, is this offensive to anybody? A little bit. Is it not offensive, but are you like thinking, oh, that's not right? Well, we used to have to do that to horses who colic a lot. Yeah. We used to have to go like So it's simply so that we can make lots of cheap beef for you to eat, right? If you don't like it, stop eating beef, right? Oh, you want to see what they do? You want to see what they do to chickens? All right. Okay, we're going to move on to our fourth polysaccharide, chitin. That's also a structural polysaccharide found in the exoskeleton of arthropods. Any questions about that sentence? So what's an arthropod, right? Arthropod includes things like the insects. The spiders, the centipedes and millipedes, crustaceans, organisms with an exoskeleton. Basically, if it's got legs and it crunches when you step on it, it's probably an arthropod. All right. Okay, so their hard, tough exoskeleton is very light and very strong. One reason for that is they've got chitin. Okay. And chitin's also found in the cell walls of many fungi. Now it's not only chitin that's found in the exoskeleton and the cell walls of fungi. There are other substances there. There are other polysaccharides and there are proteins that it's complex with, but it, it tends to be a um, a fairly prominent substance in the exoskeleton cell walls of certain fungi. It's very strong, it's very light. And it's also a polymer of glucose. But they are linked by beta-1,4 bonds. Now even though they're linked by beta-1,4 bonds, it's structurally different to cellulose. All right, chitin is structurally different to cellulose. So, here's an insect. That is an awesome picture of an insect. Anybody know what's going on here? He's leaving his body. Well, so this is a cicada, all right? And it's um, a periodical cicada, which are kind of cool. You've got 13 and 17 year periodical cicadas. And for for 13 or 17 years, they're living underground, sucking the juices from plant roots. And every 13 or 17 years, they'll synchronize. All of them will come out, crawl up the tree, and then the adult will emerge. They will leave their old skin. In other words, they'll emerge from their exoskeleton, their larval exoskeleton, and emerge as an adult. And this is one that's emerging. So the exoskeleton a very high chitin content. All right? It's polymer glucose, one five, one four, beta one four bonds, but it's structurally quite different to cellulose. So if you eat bugs, can you access the glucose in the chitin? No. You can't digest it. If you have fungi, you can. So if there's enough fungi and bacteria maybe in the digestive system, we don't have a lot of symbiotic fungi. We've got a bunch of symbiotic bacteria in our colon, and they don't produce a lot of cellulose digesting enzymes. They produce some. So it's actually kind of debatable recently about whether we're able to digest chitin. And we can a little bit. There is, we do produce in our stomach actually, a little, some enzymes that are able to break down some chitin. Okay, so there is a little bit, but not much. Okay. Now, because it is a strong polysaccharide, and we do have sort of a... a, a an ability to break it down, not quickly but slowly, it turns out it's really good to make sutures using surgery. Ones are made of? I don't know if all dissolvable ones are, right? Some. But 
One reason why we use chitin sutures is because we can do them internally and your body does slowly break them down. So you don't have to go in to remove them. Now, I don't know enough about dissolvable sutures to know if they're all made of chitin or whether they've got a chitin component, but I know it is used for that reason. Okay. And I just got to show you this picture. So anybody know what this is? It, it is indeed a butterfly. Anybody know what kind? I think it's a queen butterfly, which is very closely related to a monarch. But we have them on campus, all right? The right time of year, they're quite common. And it just emerged from this. Now, I collected this off of a milkweed plant outside several years ago, and I brought it up to my office, and I wanted to photograph it and videotape it emerging, right? And you can tell when it's going to emerge because the color gets dark. They're initially a pale green, and they get darker and darker as you can see the wings. And I remember being in there with my camera there, and I was sitting there one morning, and I knew they usually emerge about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, and I was sitting there. It was like watching paint dry, all right? It was that sort of riveting, and I thought, it's going to do it, and I just got to watch. My phone rang, and I turned around and answered the phone. Two minutes later, went back, this. It did it. The minute I turned my back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry? This is why you video. I know. If only I had a video camera. I had my steel camera. Anyway. But here you can see that the wings are quite soft, and it's pumping hemolymph insect blood into the veins of the wings to expand them. And then all the chitin polymers and the other substances in the wings, they harden, and it produces a very light, strong structure. All right, I think we'll leave it there at the lipids. Good? So don't run away. I'm going to give you back your scantrons. And anybody that wants to, and I encourage you all to, follow me into the lab, and you can do your corrections.